Good morning, church. And happy Sabbath. This morning, today, July the 2nd, is the first Sabbath of the month. Yes? And just like every first Sabbath of the month, we have our table with glow tracks for you to pick one up and share with your neighbors, with your friends and family, and, and uh, be little missionaries even here in the city of Cleburne or wherever you are. Also is when we send out our newsletter, there it's in the bulletin. But something was added to the first Sabbath of the month. Does anyone know what that might be? Fill in the baptistry, that's right. That's right. And so today, the baptistry is filled. Oh, you can't see it with the screen here. But you still wouldn't be able to see it. But you don't believe me, you can go and take... No, don't take a dive, but... <laughs> you can go and look. That the baptistry is filled today. And yet we will not have a baptism today. But we could have had a baptism today. We could have. There are people preparing themselves for baptisms. There are people preparing themselves for baptisms. And next, next Sabbath, in July, the first Sabbath of, I'm, so, I'm sorry, of August, again we will fill the baptistry. And I want you to be thinking and praying who should be in that next filling of the baptistry? Maybe it's yourself and you have prolonged surrendering your life, being baptized by the Holy Spirit fully. And coming and joining into God's church. Or maybe you know somebody or a family member or a neighbor who you know is receptive to the Word of God, is, is listening to the Holy Spirit. How many of us know somebody that we know or that we can pray or maybe are praying for, for them to make that decision to follow Jesus? Yeah. And so before I begin in uh, this, this morning's message, I want us to to for one minute be in prayer. And we're going to pray uh, for those that we want to see in those waters of baptisms. Amen. And we need to remind ourselves and I need to remind myself that the whole purpose of the church is to bring souls to the kingdom of God. It is a blessing to have a beautiful parking space. It is a blessing to have a school. It is a blessing to have a gym and to have so many things. It's going to be a blessing to have that 4th of July picnic that I'm looking forward to. But the main purpose is that all of us will see each other in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. And that we may see others there as well. So let's just spend a minute in prayer and asking God, Lord, who... Who can I bring through my efforts into the waters of baptism? Or maybe it's yourself that hasn't made that decision yet. So let's just have a, a minute of prayer and I will close with a prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you very much for your many blessings. 
Lord, thank you very much for the gift of life, for the strength and that you give us. And Lord, we, we all have people's names in our minds, friends or neighbors or families, that we need your help, your wisdom, in how we can share the gospel to them and how they c we can lead them to you. And so Lord, please take these requests, take these prayers, take these names. But most of all, take your people here that are willing to serve, willing to go out in faith, willing to do whatever it takes, Lord, to bring someone to, to the feet of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, because you hear our prayer. And thank you because your church is growing. And we just ask that it continues to grow here in Cleburne too. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 If you are somebody that would like to be baptized, just take the little cards that are in the pews and fill them out and give it to myself or the deacon in the back and we can begin the process of preparing yourself for baptisms as well. And for those that like to go and share where the bathrooms are, in between the bathrooms there are two places there in the wall full of materials that are always going to be loaded enough for you to take on any subject that you are sharing with somebody. So resources you have. And now we just need willing hearts. Amen? Amen. All right. Now let me ask you a question of how many of you do, how many of you do not like to buy generic brand things? You just don't like to buy generic brand things. You know what I'm talking about, right? You have the brand name, whether it's food or tools or whatever it is, stuff. And then you have most of the time, if not all the time, a what? A generic brand, right? Um, how many of you don't like to buy generic brand? Okay, there's a couple. The majority, you, you know, like to buy generic brand. And that's fine. I'm not... I'm not <laughs> I'm not telling you you have to buy brand names. I'm, and I'm not going to name any brand names. Uh, I'm not here to endorse any brand names. No. No, 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 no. But for me, there are just some things that the generic brand won't cut it. Just won't do it. There's nothing like Cheerios and Cheerios. The real Cheerios. You know, the, the, for cereal, for me, the generic brands, they may taste good and yes, but the real brands are the ones for me. That just, they gotta be Cheerios. They gotta be cornflakes, right? They have to be whatever it is. Whatever it is. But you can choose to buy brand names or generic uh, brands when it comes to stuff. But when it comes to religion, when it comes to religion, when it comes to the real power of God, don't settle for the devil's generic brand. Don't settle for the devil's generic brand. You see, and we've been talking about the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. And if you turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 16, Revelation, Revelation chapter 16, we're going to see that the devil does have and does do signs and wonders, but they are not from the real Holy Spirit. Revelation chapter 16, verse 13. There... John says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the, false, of the mouth of the false prophets. For they are spirits of who? Of demons. And this is not the Holy Spirit. They're spirits of demons. Performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and in the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of the God Almighty. 
Here we see, and we're going to see also in Second, Thess in Second Thess Thessalonians, that the devil can do signs and wonders. So not everything that is spiritual is godly. We need to, we need to really understand that and believe that and see it from Scripture. Not everything that is spiritual is godly. Because the devil can perform signs and wonders. And we've, we've seen there in Acts 19 on these sons of Sceva that uh, they were church members, they were pastor's kids. They wanted, to have a, they wanted to have spiritual power without full commitment to God. Without full commitment to God. And that's very dangerous because when you are looking for godly power without looking for God, Okay, pay attention here. When you are looking for godly power, but you're not looking for God, it, it, it opens you up to a power that does not come from God. When, if you are looking for godly power, but yet you're not looking for God, you're not studying the scripture, you're not interested in God, but you want godly power, it opens you up to a power that does not come from God, and the devil knows. And so he comes and may make you feel good, may, may make you feel spiritual, and you may think that you are receiving power from the Holy Spirit. And so here these sons of Sceva, they wanted the power from God, but they did not want to follow what God had said. They wanted to experience spiritual power in a sensational way. And there is a place for sensationalism. I talked about that last week. That There is a moment, you know, for that aha moment and that good feeling but it is not the measure of the Holy Spirit that's not how we measure if we have the Holy Spirit or not of how good we feel or how uh, sensational, sensational something is so that's why in 2 Thessalonians we see there if you join me in 2 Thessalonians that in these last days in these last days before Jesus comes we need to be careful from false Manifestation from generic manifestations. Second Thessalonians chapter two. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse one. The Bible says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. So this whole chapter is going to be about what? The second coming. Okay, this is, this is a second coming chapter um, context concerning the second coming. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to, be, not to be soon shaken in mind or trouble, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for the day will not come unless a falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or all that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. There's a pattern here. The devil is an expert at religion. An expert at religion. Verse 5. Do you not remember that when I was still with you I told you these things and now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. And praise the Lord for these next verses. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume. I like that part, will. He will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Praise the Lord that this falseness, this lawless one, which is the devil, and his and those that follow will be destroyed. They will not prevail, but will be destroyed. And then verse 9. The coming of the lawless one is according to the work of Satan. With what? With all powers, with all signs, and lying wonders. 
and land of wonders. There is a false brand of righteousness. And Satan has his own brand of things. He has his own brand of church, his own brand of commandments, his own brand of, of salvation, which is by works, his own brand of Sabbath, his own brand of religion. He's an expert at religion. But praise the Lord here, and I'm comforted because the only one deceived will be those who do not love the truth. That's why verse 10 says, with all unrighteousness, okay, after all the signs and powers and lying wonders, and in the context of the Lord's second coming, with all unrighteousness, deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Our greatest defense against deception is the truth. Our greatest defense against the generic brands of Satan is the truth. It's the word of God. It's the word of God. Because most of the devil's deception in the last days will not be to deceive the world, but will be to deceive the church. Will be to deceive the church. He already has the world deceived. He already has the world, as you can call it, in his pocket. They're already marching to the, to the gates of hell and they're right behind. He's got them. He doesn't even need to deceive them. They're already deceived. Unless one of them begins to follow Jesus, then he will go after that one. But meanwhile, the devil's deception in these last days is not for the world, but it's for the church. And that's why Jesus, Jesus in Matthew 24, 24, he says, watch out for false Christ and false prophets who will arise and show great signs and great wonders. He's talking to the church. Watch out for them. Watch out for them. And that's why I want you to remember that there will be more people lost in these last days because of false religion rather than no religion. Because the devil is an expert in religion and bringing confusion. There will be more people lost in these last days because of false religion rather than no religion at all. You don't believe me? Read the last chapters of the great controversy. It's poured out clear. So today, we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And all that was just part of the introduction. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, dealing with the subject of speaking in tongues. Do we believe in speaking in tongues? Is it in the Bible? Do we as Seventh-day Adventists believe that in speaking in tongues? Absolutely. But then what does that look like? Okay, what does that look like? Let see what the Bible tells us how that looks like. Not what I think. My words mean nothing. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 7. Here are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Gifts. They're plural. They're, they're, there's nine gifts. They're in, in verse 7 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But the manifestation of the Spirit. Here it is. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Verse 8 continues. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another the gift of healing by the same Spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another discerning of spirits. To another different kinds of tongues and to another interpretations of tongues. There are nine gifts there that we see that the Holy Spirit gives. And verse 11 says, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as what? As he wants to. As he wills. Not as, not as I will, no, but as he wills. As he wills. We see there that there are nine gifts and not just one gift. 
but there's several gifts, at least nine gifts. And there's also in, in Ephesians the gifts mentioned there as well. But we see that it is not just one gift, but there are many gifts. And when you read on from verse 12, this is the part where, where he compares the gifts like the body. You, let's read it there from, from verse 12. It says, For as the body is one, and hath many members, but all the members of, of that one body, being many, are one, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact the body is not one member, but many. Okay? And that makes sense. You're, you're understanding, right? Our body is made up of different parts, but it's one body. It's one body. Verse 15. If the foot if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the, of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? You see, here Paul is saying, you know, it's silly for us to think or to compare gifts as one is better than the other one. We're all the gifts are equal and all the gifts work together for the body of Christ. It is silly for us to compare one gift over another gift. It's silly to think that, well, I can speak in tongues but I don't need faith. No. All the gifts work together. I can do miracles but I don't want faith. And we sometimes, we sometimes tend to, and we are guilty, of lifting up one gift higher than the other one. And we, we, uh, we may make a fuss of a good singer, but, w but what about a good greeter? Their gift is just as important as someone who can sing very well. Or someone with great faith as well. And so Paul here is saying, don't be comparing the gifts as, as far as who has a better gift and my gift is better than your gift. No, no, no. It's all for one body under one church, just as our physical body has many parts, but we are yet one person. One person. And so then there in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul begins to, to, to explain to us the issue of, tongue, of speaking in tongues, of speaking in tongues. What, what does that mean and how does that look like? Verse, verse 1, we're going to see here that you're either edifying yourself or you're edifying the church. Verse 1 says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. So we should de desire these gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to man but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries, but he who prophesies spe speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesy for he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification so what is the purpose here of speaking in, in tongues is it just to boast yourself up and feel good no that it may benefit the church it may benefit somebody it may benefit somebody you can even see it there in verse, in verse 12 and verse 13, where it says in verse 12, even so since, no, even you, I'm sorry, even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. Now, if someone needs to interpret, 
why would they need to interpret? If I start speaking to you in Spanish, I know what interprets. Will it benefit you at all? Unless you understand Spanish, yes, but if you don't, no. The purpose of interpretation is that people understand. People understand what is being shared. What is being shared. And so we see there that it needs to be under understood. And that's why from verses 6 and onward, it says there, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 6, But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophecy, or by teaching? If you're going to speak in a tongue, it needs to be something as it says here that will teach them the gospel by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching. Verse 7, Even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sound, how will it be known what is piped or played? For if the trumpet makes an, an uncertain sound, who will prepare himself for battle? Now, I, now I don't have any experience, um, but my father was in the military, and those who have been in the military knows, know that if the trumpet is played in a certain sound, you know that means something. If it's played in a different sound, you know that means something else. And, uh, and so, here Paul is comparing the instruments. If it, do, if it doesn't make any distinction, nobody knows what is for. And that's why in verse 9 it says, So likewise you, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand. Notice that. Understand. It needs to be understood. How will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. In other words, you'll just be babbling into the air if no one is understanding what you're saying. It needs to be understood. Therefore, there are, there are, it may be so many kinds of, and notice here, it doesn't say tongues, what does it, it's, it say? So many kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him and he, and to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. So here we see that it needs to be understood. If it is a tongue, someone has to understand it. Someone has to understand it because a tongue is also a language. Now you may say, or someone may say, but I speak in an unknown tongue, speaking maybe to God or speaking to angels. So I want you to look quickly here in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2. Now I'm reading from the New King James. Is anyone reading else? Does anyone here have a King James Bible? Okay, good, perfect. For he who speaks in a what kind of tongue? <laughs> Unknown tongues. But that the New King James says what? It just says tongue. If you notice, the word unknown is in italics. Yes? Okay. If you look at also verse 4. He who speaks in a, my Bible says tongue. King James in a unknown tongue. And you'll find that in verse 13, 14, 15, 16, and 27. That the word unknown is in italics, which clearly says or means that the word unknown is not in the original Greek. It's not originally in there. And it makes sense because if it's, gonna, if it's a tongue, somebody has to know it. There's no such thing as an unknown tongue. It's like saying there's an unknown language, then there is no language. In order for there to be a language, somebody in the face of this world has to speak that language. For it to be a language, for it to be a tongue. So, that's why uh, more modern translation, even the New King James, they realize that 
the, the tongues had to be understood and because it wasn't even supplied in the original, they just took it out. And that's why you see it in, in, in italics. Any word in the Bible that you see in, in italics, the translators supplied it in there. It wasn't in the original language as well. So, so tongues in the Bible is another word for languages. We can see there also in verse 28. In verse 28 of 1 Corinthians 14. It says, but if there is no interpreter, let him keep... Oh, this is right here, the good text. Okay, if there is no interpreter, someone is speaking a, a language, but there, but there is no interpreter, let him keep what? Silent in the church. And let him speak to himself and to God. You know, Alex was just up here earlier. I don't know how many languages he speaks, but he speaks more than one or two. Uh, and, one, and one of those is Portuguese. If he were to begin speaking in Portuguese and nobody were to translate him, he or Paul is saying, you know what, buddy, it's just better if you what? Just be quiet. And you want to speak Portuguese to God, you can speak Portuguese to God all you want. But if we want to share to you, somebody has to what? Interpret what you're saying. Why? So we can benefit of what he's saying. Whether it's Portuguese, Spanish, German, French, whatever language it may be. So we can benefit. And so here comes my favorite text when it comes to understanding what the Bible says about speaking in tongues. In 1 Corinthians 14, the same chapter, verse 22. 22. Okay, this is the grand slam. This is the slam dunk. Therefore, tongues are for a sign not to those who believe but to unbelievers. Did you just catch that? <laughs> therefore, I'm glad somebody's getting it. Therefore, some, therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to the unbelievers. But prophesying is not for the unbeliever, but for those who believe. Tongues, speaking in tongues is not, is not for the believers. It's not for, for ourselves, but it's for the unbelievers. It's to convince the gospel to unbelievers. We already believe in the gospel. I don't need to convince you that Jesus died for you. That's why you're here. You believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Speaking in tongues is for unbelievers to convince them of the gospel, not to excite them or confuse them, no, but to convince them of the Bible, of the gospel, of the plan of salvation. And so, with, with even much less of a reason to be practiced in church, if it's not for believers, but yet for unbelievers. Unless you have a church filled with unbelievers, then you can speak in their common language that they may understand. And that's why in verse 33, Paul says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. And that makes perfect sense with our scripture reading there in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, there are three places in the entire Bible where speaking in tongues occurs. Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, and Acts chapter 19. Those are the only three places in the entire Bible where speaking in tongue occurs. And our scripture reading is there in Acts chapter 2. So let's go there. Just after knowing and seeing that the Bible says that speaking in tongues is one of the gifts, not the gift, but one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gives it to whoever He pleases. We see that it needs to be understood. People need to understand what you are saying. And if there is no one to interpret your language, which is, which is tongue, then just be quiet. And so that there, that's what in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Now when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound 
from heaven as a rushing mighty wind and it lit and it filled the whole house where they were sitting then they appear there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire and one sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance now verse 5 Verse 5 makes it clear as glass. Now therefore, now, I'm, I'm sorry, now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, from every nation under heaven. Don't miss that. From every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because why? They, because everyone heard them speaking in his own language. Can you imagine that? Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? So did they understand what the apostles were saying? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then it goes on to describe from other places, from Mesopotamia, from Asia, from Judea, from Egypt, from Libya, from other places, even Arabs. When the Bible says here that in verse 5, that there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews and devout men from every nation under heaven. What, would, what was God doing? God saw the opportunity of all the people, mostly of the, all the world, gathered in one area. And he said, this is an opportunity to share them the gospel. But my men don't know how to speak all these languages, so I will give it to them. And he took advantage of the opportunity of all the people from everywhere in the world. And he gave them the gift to speak their language. To speak their language and speak it fluently and and know and share the gospel and share the gospel verse 11 after it talks about all the places it says we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God see the gifts all the gifts of the Holy Spirit are for the as we read there the edification of the church for the edification of the church. They weren't speaking in their common language and talking business and talking about... Uh, no, they were sharing the gospel. They were sharing the plan of salvation. They were sharing probably on how what Pentecost really means and how Jesus came and died and crucified and is risen again. But I do want to say with all seriousness and sincerity that there are very sincere people. That there are very sincere people who do not understand this. And believe that the speaking in tongues is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit that is produced in making noise that no one understands. And we're not going to make fun of them, no. Although they are sincerely wrong, they are sincere Christians who love the Lord just like you and I love the Lord. But we need to know what is speaking in tongues and what it isn't. And so just as a summary, there are several gifts, nine spiritual gifts. None of them is more important than the other. Just as Paul compared it to the body, they all work together for the edification of the church. None is more important than the other. The gift of tongue is not for believers, but is for unbelievers to share with them the gospel. What is said needs to be understood. And they need to understand what they're saying. And God should not be connected with confusion or disorder. So do we believe in speaking in tongues? Absolutely. 
And there are and have been places and people and missionaries that God has given them the gift of a speaking in tongues to share with somebody the love of Jesus to them. Without taking a course in that language of weak. No, God just, God just saw the opportunity. You see, God knows which heart is receptive and ready. And if there isn't anybody there to speak that language, God says, I'll take care of it. And He gives them the power to speak in that language. And they speak the gospel, the love of Jesus to anyone with, with an open, receptive heart. Satan, Satan wants to give us a generic brand of everything that God does. Of everything that God does. A generic gospel, generic plan of salvation based on works, a generic Sabbath, a generic manifestation of the Holy Spirit. He wants generic Christians. But I want to be a real Christian. I want the real gospel. I want the real plan of salvation, which is based on, on grace and the merits of Jesus Christ and not my merits. I want the real Sabbath. I want the real power of the Holy Spirit. Not a generic or a fake one. I want to be a real Christian. I want to be a real Seventh-day Adventist. Amen. 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 And it, it, and it is... It is by surrendering our hearts, by listening to that small, still voice, by submitting to Him. It may feel good, you may get emotional, but it is not based only on emotion and thrill. The Holy Spirit comes at that small, still voice and tells us this is the way and follow it. I want to be a real Christian, a real Seventh day Adventist, and not take the devil's generic brands. How about you? Amen. Amen. So don't settle for generic brands when it comes to religion, when it comes to the plan of salvation, when it comes to your eternal life, when it comes to the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I want to thank you for your holy word that is true. And Lord, if there's anything that I said that has hurt or offended somebody, Lord, forgive me. Those, you know, those were not my intentions, Lord, but your word is clear. And sometimes your word may cut or maybe offend us. But Lord, help us to be submissive if it is in your word. And so thank you, Father, because you do pour out your spirit with miracles, with faith, with languages. Thank you very much. Because they are all ways that we can share the good news of your Son to others. And so, Lord, I just ask that you help each one of us to seek the real. To seek the real gospel, the real plan of salvation, the real manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Lord, to be real Christians. Because you, you live in us and because, as it says there in 2 Thessalonians, we love the truth. We love the truth. Lord, we love you and we want to love you even more. Bless your church and bless us on this your holy day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.